Yes, I am here. I see Linda. Yeah. I just thought I'd take a minute to focus on Jesus. There's an old saying out there that says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And G good morning, Linda. And Jesus is the main thing. The Bible even says so. It says that God granted that in him should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell, that he might have the preeminence. It was actually God's intention to do that. So yeah, glad to have you with me today. Uh, we're a little bit different time frame today. And yes, I'll turn the camera around in a minute. Uh, this is Words of Encouragement. It's, it's November 6, 2023, and this is episode 691. So I wanted to start out this morning by giving you a little bit of a tour. So I am at the Salem House of Prayer this morning. And uh, again, our time has changed a little bit. Not only did we move the time to 8 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time or West Coast Time, Salem Time, because I'm in Salem. But then also we have the uh, fall back, right? Yeah, I know you can probably see my shadow. The fall back where we set our clocks back too. So yeah, anyway, so there's my beloved Linda, my wife of 40, is it two years? I probably should get that right. Love you, babe. Anyway, so I'm at the house of prayer and I just wanted to do a little bit of a tour. I'll probably try not to move too fast, but I just kind of wanted to, this is the loft that um, we created for yours truly to be able to pray in uh, years ago and spend much, much time in here praying many hundreds and hundreds of hours up here seeking the Lord. And uh, as all of you know, uh, Linda and I, uh, we're not retired. Don, if you're listening, Pastor Don spoke about that. We're not retired but we are on a new assignment and doing different things now. So uh, the director of the Salem House of Prayer now is Richard and his wife, Ginger Frank, and they're wonderful people, and they're doing just a great job. So we say hats off to them, and uh, we're going to be here Friday night. I'll tell you about that in a minute. So anyway, this is the place where we would come and pray. That chair right there has been here. Oh, my God goodness, well over a decade and slippers down there. And yeah, many, many years praying there. And there's the, there's the bookshelf and some of the stuff. There's some of my old staffs and, and my sword. I probably ought to get some of my stuff out of here since Richard is using it. Uh, mostly there's my sword. Anyway, all a collection of the many hundreds and hundreds of books that I've had whittled it down to just a few books. And I'll show you just over the prayer room here. I'm I'm trying to, sorry about that, trying to kind of keep it out of the light so it doesn't blind you. But looking over the edge, so this is an open air loft <clears throat> where I used to come up and now Richard comes up and seeks the Lord when he needs some privacy because people have a tendency to come in the prayer room and want to talk to you and all that. Now it's early in the morning and right now um, the place is quiet and uh, which uh, I don't particularly like. <laughs> Because my heart is to, uh, yeah, have glory, glorious worship going all the time. But I, yeah, no, I, I'm just kidding. It's, we have our times of quiet and our times of not. Justin or Tammy, that looks like Tammy. God bless you. Anyway, so there's the, uh, uh, one chart where we chart the different groups that come in and pray. And of course, there's the, the platform. And you know, I, it's kind of a walk down memory lane for me every time I come here because all of this stuff, I mean, we were here for every single one of these things that happened and, you know, all the chairs and the lighting. And I mean, it's just amazing to uh, think of <clears throat> not taking like credit or anything, but just thinking of the things that God did here over the years. So anyway, there's another uh, chart, but that is the churches. It's, you can't see it, but it says uh, holding up the churches of Salem. And there are, I don't know, three, six, seven times, there are, I don't know, 50, 60 churches up there that the House of Prayer faithfully shot praise over. So um, if you wonder if your name is on there, come down. If your church name is on, if it's not, I'm sure they'd love to put it on. And then the uh, theme, one of the theme scriptures of the House of Prayer right there, and will not God, these are not our words, but the words of Jesus. 
Jesus said to his disciples, will not God give justice to his elect? That's you and me who cry to him or pray to him, worship him day and night. Will he delay long over them? And the last part of the scripture says he will not delay. So God is faithful to answer prayer. All right. So and then there's the uh, the sound booth. And I remember when we built that. And then there's the upstairs loft area. All right. So I'm going to go and sit down. And I want to uh, take a few minutes to talk to you about uh, some things that God has laid on my heart out of the scripture. I mean, it's like uh, there's so much going on in the world right now. So much going on in the church. The Lord is doing some pretty amazing things in the church right now in the body of Christ. Uh, he is changing, um, changing things. He's shaking things up, as it were. Let me adjust my camera there. He's really making a lot of changes in the whole world. And you've heard me talk about this before and, you know, about how the Bible says that everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Actually, God promised that. Jesus promised that. He said, if it's shakable, I'm paraphrasing, if it's shakable, I'm going to shake it. And as in all things, he does that for our good. So a lot's being shaken in the, um, in the spirit world, a lot's, you know, in the religious world. <coughs> Excuse me, the seven mountains of influence and, you know, the body of Christ and, uh, you know, politically in the world and socially. There's just, and it's not going to slow down. The birth pangs that are leading us to the, the full appearing of the kingdom of God. The Lord is advancing his kingdom. He said he was going to do that. Jesus came on the scene and said he was going to do that. And he's been doing it for 2,000 years. He's not going to stop. He won't stop for you or I or, or the president or some other country or war or famine. It's, he is going to keep pressing for his kingdom. Why? Because there isn't anything better than that. It's kind of an amazing thing. You know, I've done a lot of funerals. Every funeral I go to, people go to heaven, right? And even people that don't believe in heaven are kind of like, yeah, I kind of hope they're, not, they're in a better place. Sometimes I ask the question, how many believe your loved ones are in a better place? Everyone except maybe one or two raise their hand. Because we all have that in us. There's eternity in our hearts. We know there's something better coming, right? And so, but there's a disconnect sometimes about the right now, the here and now. What does the Lord want now? Why would we expect the kingdom, and he heaven is his kingdom, okay? He's a king, right? He's a king. He's a king of kings. And he's got a kingdom. He's a good king. He's not like the kings you see on TV or whatever. He is the best king. He's the king that actually loves his people and does what he does because he wants them to be benefited. You know, it's like any decent parent, when they tell their kids, you know, no, don't go out and play in traffic or no, you can't. Uh, I'm not going to go out and buy weed for you at six years old so you can smoke marijuana. I'm not going to let you go out and, and sh you know, shoot, brandish your gun. I mean, we do what we do if we're good people. Because we love our kids. Well, God is the best father. Okay, our fathers and mothers may not have always done well, but he, ne you can never accuse him of not doing well. And if you think he hasn't done good by you, one day you'll find out you were wrong. One day you'll get to heaven and you'll find out and God will say, here's why this happened. And you'll go, Psh, I totally get it now. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> his kingdom is good. He is good. He's always good. Even though you don't feel like he's always good, he's always good, okay? So um, I just want to say real quick, we're going to be here Friday night, and I'll announce it one more time at the end of the program here. It's going to be a little bit short today. Um, uh, here at the Salem House of Prayer, if you're within 100 miles, you better come. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, we just really want to see everybody and hug your neck and, and give the word of the Lord as we feel it and so on. But this coming Friday, that's the 10th, so just a few days away, uh, November 10th, Friday night, 7 p.m., right here in downtown Salem. Uh, we're going to be here worshiping everyone, rejoicing with everyone. Hey, listen, God's still on the throne. It doesn't matter what, what everybody else is doing. God is still on the throne, right? And we have a reason to rejoice even in the midst of tragedy and heartache and disappointment. We can still rejoice. So we're going to be here at 7 o'clock. Love to see you. Love to have you come. 
Uh, you say, I already have plans, Jim. Cancel your plans. And I'm just, I'm just kidding. Don't, if they're really important, don't cancel them. But if they are, if you're just like, I was going to go to the movies that night, cancel them. All right, anyway. So, hope to see you then. So, uh, the other day I was listening to some music as I was praying. And, um, I mean, I get blessed by so much uh, Christian music, some more than others. But uh, Misty Edwards was singing a song. Now, Misty has brought for some of the most powerful songs that uh, I think in the last, in this generation. And um, one of them, uh, it's called Fully in Love. Now, I, I didn't have the time to find the link, so you'll have to look it up, but I did put the name and the words in the description box here. And the, I guess it's the bridge of the, uh, the song has these words. And these are really important, so lean in. Listen close. <clears throat> She's talking about the purpose of God. You know, people want to know what's the purpose. I remember as a sinner, before the Lord came into my life, I would sit in my chair assembly when I come, you know, and I would just contemplate the meaning of life. Now, that may sound funny, but it was true. I didn't understand what was the point. Was I just another, a blob of flesh? Was I just a biological whatever? And uh, when I'm done, I'm done, and I go back to the dirt, and I'm warm food, and nothing matters anymore. And I knew that could not be true. There was this cry in my heart that it wasn't true. And so I would ask myself, but then my mom got saved. Thank you, Mom. And, uh, and I started thinking about God, thinking about, wait a minute, maybe I am not just a natural creature um, that has been birthed into the world and dies and it's all over. Maybe I am what I say now, what I say now is that I am a eternal creature having a temporary earthly experience. Okay? Made by God, I will live forever, so will you. Heaven or hell, you're going to live forever. I guarantee you're going to live forever. So how can you know that? Well, I've had enough encounters with the Lord to know it's absolutely true. I believed it before I ha had these encounters of the Lord, but since I've had these encounters, it's like driven as a nail. You know, you don't have to have some dramatic supernatural experience to have faith. Okay, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I believed in Jesus before I saw him, but I've seen him about nine times now. So, I mean, that helped a lot, but it, it happened after I'd served him and believed without seeing him for a long time. And And if God chose that, I would never have seen him. It would have been okay. Anyway... What's my purpose? What's your purpose? What are we here for? What did God do all of this for? Was he just like really bored because he's eternal and he lived for a million years before he made the earth, you know, and he just had to have something to do? No, he loves people. He wants fellowship with people and so on. So anyway, I was listening to this Missy Edwards song. I know I'm rambling. Uh, I uh, And it goes like this. There's the bridge in the song that goes, uh, it's what you wanted. Let's see. S see if I can sing it. It's what you wanted in the garden. It's what you wanted on the mountain. It's what you wanted on the cross beam. Just a heart that is fully in love. It's what you wanted in the garden. It's number one. It's what you wanted on the mountain. It's what you wanted on the cross beam. Just a heart that is fully in love. And that, as I heard that, as I've heard it many, many times, but this time it was like the Lord came and he landed upon me and he just started blowing that up in my spirit. And I want to blow it up in your spirit today. I'm going to take about 15 minutes to go through those three elements. If you saw the picture on Facebook, it's of a garden, of a mountain, Mount uh, Sinai or Zion, and then, uh, and then the cross of the Lord. What did he want in each one of those things? I am here to tell you he wanted the exact same thing. These were different stages, different phases of human development and of the way God dealt with human beings according to our development, how we learned over time. You know, Adam and Eve came into the world. They didn't know anything about anything except that God made them and they're in the garden, you know. And then we, I don't like to use the word evolved because it freaks people out, but we did. We grew and we, we understood more. God is not the one that grew, okay? I, have, I hear people say that it's honestly, I'm going to be a little harsh here. It's blasphemy. 
It is really unmitigated blasphemy to say that God was immature and he grew up. That's just so foolish. We're the ones, okay? And so as we grow, just like you as a parent, as your child grows, you get to deal with them differently. Okay, so long, long time ago, <laughs> the Lord was dealing in a different way. All right, so let's look at those three things. I do have scriptures that go with those. The first one is Genesis uh, chapter 2 in the garden. Let's talk about what he wanted in the garden. And you know the answer already. I mean, you know what he wanted, a heart that's fully in love. He made man and put men in the garden. I have a saying. I, I uh, think it's doctrinally correct. Hi, Estella. Hi, Christy. God bless you. Hope to see you Friday, Christy. Anyway, um, that God, now God could have put man anywhere. He could have put him in a submarine. He could have put him on a cloud. He could have put him, you know, in, I don't know, anywhere. He could have put him on a mountain. He could have put him in a desert. He put man in a garden. Now, why did he do that? I, I'm going to tell you this. It's going to blow your mind. You need to dwell on it and think about it. Good morning. God put man in the garden, in a garden, because man is the garden of God. If you've ever read the Song of Songs, the bridegroom, which is a type of Jesus, says to the bride, which is a type of you and I, his, his bride, his church, he says, you are my garden. Mankind is the garden of God. He gets delight from us. He also gets pain and sorrow from us. Okay, And when you love someone, it's really hard to keep hurting them and causing them pain and sorrow. You get what I'm saying? Love is the great motivator. It's the thing that motivated him to make you, and it's the thing that motivates us best to want to walk with him and please him and do the right thing. Not because if we don't, we're afraid of going to hell, Although hell's a bad thing, and then we want to avoid hell for sure, right? What we do is super important. Obedience is crucial. But why are we obedient? You know, you can obey God for the wrong reason, okay? God wants us to be motivated with the same thing he's motivated with. He didn't make the earth just so that he could say, now obey me or else I'm going to turn you into a grease spot and cast your body and soul into hell. That's not why he made man. He made man because he wants our fellowship. It's what you wanted in the garden. Okay, going back to that course, I missed you. I wish I could have found the link. It's what you wanted in the garden, just a heart that is fully in love. A heart. You see, when you are fully in love, it's really tough to just hurt the one that you love. We ought to be praying every single day. Hey, Gab, I see yesterday. We ought to be praying every single day that God will increase love in our hearts. Practically, emotionally, because love isn't just what you do, but it is what you do. Love isn't just what you feel, but it is what you feel. Okay, Love isn't just what you think and say, but it is what you think and say. It's all of the above. We always want to make it so simple that, that we don't have to think too much about it, but really, the scripture declares, he said, that Jesus said, okay, do we still believe Jesus? Somebody raise your hands. He said this, he said, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, it's your mind, will, and emotions, your, your heart's your spirit, man, the inside of you, and your flesh, your strength. We are body, soul, and spirit. So what did he want in the garden? He wanted to walk with man. I shouldn't just say man, humankind, man and, man and woman, Adam and Eve, he wanted to walk with mankind. He demonstrated so it's kind of like this is what's called the it was like the prototype as it were okay all you got to do is go back to the first couple and find out what god wanted it's really su super easy he wanted he gave them work to do because work is good for us right he gave us assignments to do to work with him with him alongside of him i don't think adam just named all the animals you know and just you know god left for a while and then came back i think he partnered with god in doing that because that's what God wants. He wants partnership. We always think that God just, you know, God's will is always done. How many times have you heard that? God's will is always done. That's just not true. It's not true. <laughs> he says, I'm not willing that any should perish. A lot of people perish. His will is not done. What did Jesus pray when he taught us how to pray? He said, he prayed, our Father, Son, our Son, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Why would we pray for the will of God to be done if it's always done? You see, sometimes these theories and these doctrines come along and they sound really nice and everything, but they're just not true. Okay, God's will is done 
in many, if not most cases, because you decide it will be done. Okay, and love is the great motivator. So what did he want in the garden? He wanted to walk with mankind. He wanted a fellowship. He wanted a partner. He said, let's do this thing together. I'm going to show you what love is. I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate my love to you and so on. What did Satan want? Well, just the opposite. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> actually, I probably should read it, shouldn't I? So that's two, chapter two, verse seven. It says this, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Uh, it's a little, little, I don't have good light up here. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man there that he had made. And then out of the garden, he caused all the good things to grow. Now, here's an important component to this before we move on. It says he planted in the garden the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, it took me a long time to understand really what this meant. <clears throat> if I was the Lord, thank God I'm not, I would have planted the two trees and I'd have called one the tree of, of uh, the tree of life, right? The tree of life, which we're going to find out in Revelation in a couple of minutes, is actually in heaven. Did you know that? The tree that was in the Garden of Eden is actually in heaven and it's multiplied. Anyway, so I would have made the tree of life and the tree of what? Opposite death, right? So let's call all these two trees. You got two trees. Let's call one the tree of that all things spring from one the tree of life and one the tree of death. That is reasonable. Well, God's smarter than me and you. And he says, no, let's make the title of the second tree just a little bit longer. Let's call it the, the tree. It is a tree of death. No doubt about it. You eat that tree, it says you're going to die, right? And it's the same thing is true for us today. As long as we keep eating that tree, death is on the way. Okay, But he didn't call it the tree of death. He called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I don't have a ton of time to go through this because I want to get to my other scripture. But let me just tell you, break it down basically what that means. That means instead of you focusing on living for God, the life of Jesus, fellowship with him, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and, and the life. And the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and so on. But I've come to my life and that more abundantly. Instead of focusing on life being about walking with him, you focus on being a good person. Now, some people still need a big revelation of this. We're not saying you're not supposed to be a good person. God forbid. God didn't say that either. Okay? He actually said, once they ate that tree, now they're like us. So it's obvious. He does want us to know there's good and evil. But it's not about knowing. It's about doing. Okay? It's about thinking like millions of people today think that one day I'm going to stand before God and he's going to weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds and whichever I've done the most of wins. If I've been mostly good and sometimes bad, I win, okay, and I get to go to heaven. If I've been mostly bad and not very good, I lose and I go to hell. That is so completely out. People don't go to hell because they do bad things. They go to hell because they reject the sacrifice for their bad things that Jesus made. See, we're not going to stand before God and, and he's going to, you know, catalog everything and put them in, in a big balance, you know, like you see the justice statue that's got the blindfold on. She's holding the, the scales, you know, and no, 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 no. Jesus came to tip the scales in your favor. We don't get what we deserve. We get what he deserves. But you have to accept that. You have to say yes to that. If we don't receive the sacrifice Jesus made in order that we can become lovers of him like he loves us, then there's nothing left but to have to answer for yourself. You get what I'm saying? Nobody wants to stand before God. I don't. And, and hope for the best. You know, I've never met a soul in my life that's going to stand before the Lord and and have this where God says, "Oh yeah, man, you were you were you're gonna you were so wonderful. You, I'm gonna let you in." It's not gonna happen. Hi, Tammy. God bless you. Hope to see you Friday, Tammy. You get what I'm saying? We're not. You know, I think we don't understand the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. He is so much different and better than we are. That's why he sent his son. As an example, this, okay, listen to me close. This is the way I intended human beings to be. 
like Jesus. How many of you want to stand before God and say, yep, I measured up to that. Yep, I didn't really have a relationship with God, never accepted his blood sacrifice, kind of the cross, that whole thing kind of turned me off. But I've been as good as Jesus, so I get to go in. No, <laughs> no, you're not. You do not want to stand before him and go, well, I, you know what, I was disappointed because he didn't answer my prayers. And there was this pastor who, you know, committed adultery or my mom and dad, you know, they, they did these bad. No, no, you don't want any of that. Okay, so what did he want in the garden? Love. A heart that was fully in love. Okay? It's not about weighing your good deeds against your bad. It's about accepting his sacrifice so that you can know him. It wasn't about, the sacrifice of the cross was not the end. It, it wasn't all about, Jesus didn't go to the cross just so you could be forgiven. A lot of people think that. They think, well, I've been forgiven because I asked you to forgive me. Good, praise God. I'd hate it for it not to be that. <laughs> you, know, you know, again, you don't want to stand before God, have all your sins brought up and go, and they're not forgiven. Well, I just didn't know if I could believe in Jesus and the cross. Uh, that's not going to be a happy day, okay? But even so, I've been forgiven, okay? What happens after that? The journey actually begins there. The journey, what, Jim? The journey to what he intended for you and every other human being on the planet to know him, to walk with him, to love him the way he loves you. So what did he want in the garden? A heart that was fully in love. That's why he put them there. That's why, that's why he created mankind. Once you get hold of this, that God created mankind for this purpose, to love him, it will change your life. I guarantee it'll change. All right. So what did he want on the mount? So the three stages that Misty sings about, the garden, and then Mount Sinai, and then, and then, um, and then the cross. Okay, the garden, the mountain, the cross. So the mountain, let's flip to that real quick. That's in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 20, verse 19. I thought I had it marked. Yep, here it is. Okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, 19. Let's see what it says. Many people don't realize. So you might think of when, when we talk about Exodus 20 that we're thinking about the Ten Commandments. And it's true, right? Why the Ten Commandments? Okay, they're up on the mountain. The glory of God comes on the mountain. It is all a fire and all a smoke. Okay, God is giving the law. Oh no, the law, the law, oh God. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. God made the law. The Bible says the law was good. It served a purpose. We are supposed to move beyond. Okay, anyway, that's a whole nother story. But please don't be that guy, that gal that's like, oh, every time the word law is mentioned, somehow you freak out about it. You know that we're actually still under a law. I know that's going to shock some of you out of your cord, but let me tell you, it's true. I can show you in the New Testament two or three times where it says that we are under a different kind of a law, L-A-W law. No, we don't, we don't, no, it's not, no, 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 it is. It's just changed what the law is. It calls it the perfect law of love. We're not under the 600 and whatever command. No, it is, we're not lawless people, okay? Call it rules if you can't stand the word law. If you can't stand the word rules, call it, you know, paradigms. <laughs> we get so hung up on words. Anyway, anyway, when God gave the Ten Commandments, okay, which are not the same as the Mosaic laws, but anyway, can't go down that road. When he gave the Ten Commandments, a lot of people stop in Exodus chapter 20 before the very last part. The very last part starts in verse number 18. Say, after he's done this and he's given the Ten Commandments, it says, All the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. What a sight this must have been. Gosh. Uh, and they, the people saw it. They trembled, which was actually a good thing. Okay. Holy fear can help produce love in your heart. We're not talking about Satan here. Don't clump all the fear. All fear in the same category. It's not. There are two categories. 365 times in the Bible, it told us, fear not. That's because that's the wrong kind of fear. That's the devil's fear. That's, but 300 times, it, it says, talk about fearing the Lord. That's the good stuff, okay? So don't mix up the two. Know the difference. Anyway, it says they feared and trembled. And this was the part that wasn't good. They stood far off. 
at some point, I didn't have time to find it, but the Lord actually invited them to come up, not this time. And I think one time the, the elders, it said, did come up and they ate and drank with God. And yeah, anyway, they saw the Lord. But it says they stood afar off and they said to, listen to what they said to Moses. You speak for us. You see, we want a mediator. We want, if we don't want the priesthood, okay, like the Catholic Church and other religions, and I'm not downing the Catholic Church, although, yeah, whatever. Anyway, we're always looking for a mediator. And if we're not in that group, we want, we want a pastor. We want a bishop. We want an elder. <clears throat> Listen, those things are ordained of God. I'm a pastor. I have been a pastor my whole life. I believe that that's what they've got, or it wouldn't be that it says so in the Bible, right? Yet, it's not meant to take a place of your primary purpose in relation with God. What did he want on the mountain? When he was given the Ten Commandments and all the other laws, what did he want? Okay, it says, do not let you speak with us, do not speak with us, lest we die. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near. You see, God wants us to draw near to him. That's what he wanted on the mount. At that time in human development, they needed the law. Okay? And we still need that moral compass. You know, most societies have a standard that is based on the Ten Commandments, whether they would agree or uh, confess that or not. It's true. All right, I got to hurry along. Luke chapter 23. Let's move to the third one. So that was what he wanted on the garden and what he wanted on the mountain. Now we're going to talk about what he wanted on the cross beam. Okay? I think understanding this same concept. So he wanted love in the garden. He wanted love. When he gave the law, he wasn't doing it just to make life hard on people. Okay? That's not what he was. He was trying to protect humanity. He was trying to show you, I know you don't understand this right now, but if you lie, cheat, and steal, if you commit adultery, if you lust after your neighbor's wife or their goods, if you take the name of the Lord your vein, if you do all these things, it's going to hurt you. Okay, and your your I call that God says God says I call that sin. Okay, <laughs> okay, you know we come up with a lot of other words, but God God still calls it sin. And He says if you do these things, okay, I'm not saying them to prove I have more power than you or I have the authority to cast you into hell if you don't do it. That's not what He's doing. He's saying I'm protect. Think about this. You need a paradigm shift. Okay, the same way a parent says don't go kill your neighbor, right? Gosh, <laughs> that's why God is saying. Not only to protect the neighbor, but to protect you. So it's still about love. It's still about God saying, I love you too much to let you do like the nations are doing that don't know me, like those who are barbaric and heathens and so on. All right? So, but really, yeah, the main thing is love. All right, so the garden, love. The mountain, love. The cross beam. I think one of the best ways to see what Jesus was doing on the cross is found in a single phrase. And that uh, phrase, let's see, verse number 32, 23-32. The people stood, up, stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered. You see how people treat God when, when God is vulnerable? He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, let him, the chosen of God, let him come down from the cross. And others mocked him, and they offered him sour wine and so on. And this is what Jesus said. Or and they said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And, uh, oops, I forgot the one verse I wanted to read. Uh, it says, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. Imagine crucifying Jesus. I'd never do that. You know what? I'll bet you there were people right there in that crowd that had said the same thing after their son or daughter was healed. Or maybe their son or daughter didn't get healed and they got mad at God because they couldn't make God do what they wanted him to do. Okay? And here they are crucifying him. And there were two criminals, one on either side of him. Okay? And it says, Father, when Jesus looked on the right and the left, he said, all those people who were abusing him, I want you to see the heart of God. I cannot think of a better demonstration. What you wanted on the cross beam? 
just a heart that is full of love. Even the people that were torturing and killing him, he had love for them. How do you know he loved them? How do you know it wasn't Adam? Well, because he said, I could call 12 legions of angels. That's thousands of angels. He said, right now I could be delivered. Aren't you glad he chose not to be delivered? You know what is stunning? He could have been. He didn't have to say yes. You, do you get that? Jesus didn't lie. He said, don't you know right now I could call 12 legions of angels. My father would send him. You know what he was saying? He's saying, I don't have to say yes. God would back me up if I called for those angels to get me off this cross right now. Think about that. He did not have to say yes. Wow. What if he hadn't? We'd be standing in front of God on our own merits. And you don't want that. So what did he pray for them? For the very people that were shedding his blood, you know, hurting him. If you've never watched uh, the uh, um, the Passion, I can only think of the Chosen because that's when I, the Passion, where it, where it highlights basically the, the days before the Lord's crucifixion up to his crucifixion, it is it is unbelievably brutal what they did to him, and yet he prayed for them, Father, forgive them. Because they really don't know what they're doing. If they really knew what they were doing. I had the Lord uh, come to me one time and give me understanding of that. Because I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, they knew what they were doing. They were killing him. They knew that. They weren't like deceived, right? They're like, you know, slashing him open with a cat of nine tails. Oh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, no, no, they knew exactly on that level what they were doing. And the Lord showed me, he said, Jim, if they could have seen me a few hours after I died, they would have changed their mind. It's the same way as we see people sometimes through the lens of what they're doing right now. And it's understandable. Okay, we see somebody doing something bad and we think of them as bad. Okay, but what if you could see that person a few years down the road where they've repented and they're now changed and God who was rich in mercy and grace would not write them off like we do or kill them like we do. But he says, no, I want to save. I'm not willing that any should perish. I want to save this person no matter how bad they were. And you see them. And then that person went on into heaven and you see them seated in the heavenly places with Jesus with a crown of gold on their head and the glory of the Lord shining through their face like no human being on earth has right now. If you could be fast forwarded into their life, like I have many people I know, I see Christy right there. Her mom's in heaven. My dad's in heaven. If you could see them right now, you know what? It would freak you out. I'm telling you, it would freak you out. The glory of the Lord. They're not just up there looking like they looked on the earth. Sin is gone. Okay. The health is there. I mean, the glory of Jesus shining in them and through them. We, here's my point. We would change our mind about people now if we could see them in the future. And that's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't really know who I am. What did he want on the cross beam? Just a heart that's fully in love. Just a heart that's full. Just a heart that says, I don't always understand. I get mad sometimes. I stumble sometimes. But my heart and really, he doesn't just want a heart, okay? Because it's easy to go, yeah, I just love Jesus with all my heart. But he wants your body too. He does. He wants your body to come in line with your heart. Somebody say amen, okay? All right, so he prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I think I'm about out of time here. I had two other passages that I was going to read. One was in Matthew 24 where it says, in the last days, which I believe we're living in, <clears throat> because sin abounds, iniquity abounds, lawlessness abounds. Actually, it's, it's lawlessness, which is back to the whole, we're under the royal law of love, Jesus said. Um, it says, because iniquity or lawlessness abounds, multiplies, many people's love is going to grow cold. And we see that all the time happening right now. I don't want your love to grow cold. Okay, I, do, I don't want your love to grow cold. I want you to grow in love with God, more in love with God. And you can have that, but you have to believe it enough to ask for it. You actually have to pursue it. I remember a testimony of a guy that went to heaven and Jesus said to him, he said, go tell my people desire is not enough. They have to pursue what they desire. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, there's so many people that just don't get, to. I'm sitting in this room right now 
And most people that I talk to believe that if there was ongoing prayer by a unified body of Christ happening in this city, it would change the city, but they actually don't come to do it. We have to move beyond saying we believe something to doing what we say we believe. And when it comes to loving God with all your heart and soul and strength, you have to move beyond going, I love him with all my heart. You need to love him with your body too. Amen. Desire must lead to pursuit. Psalm 27, 4, not to be confused with Psalm 24, 7, okay? Because in part of a 24, 7 ministry, but the opposite, Psm 27, 4, David, a king, who was busier than you and I will ever be, had more responsibility, and probably had more faults than you and I will ever have. He said one thing about desire, there's desire, okay? Well, he said there's desire. One thing about desire, that will I seek. Desire must lead to pursuit. As I say, according to this, yeah, probably. I have to check that out, Linda. All right, so in the last days, I want to leave you with this. It says that because uh, iniquity abounds, lawlessness abounds, it increases most people's love. Really, the, the Greek word is most people's love. And we're watching people's love go cold. I don't want that to happen to you. So how how... Sin, iniquity, is the enemy of love. Let, let me hammer that. Sin is the enemy of love. A lot of people want to love Jesus more and so on, and yet they're bound. You need to get deliverance. You need to get free because sin is the enemy of love. It will cause your love to wax cold. It's not just about being, it's not legalism. Okay, we're not talking about, it's about God protecting. It's about God saying, no, 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 no. If sin is abounding in your heart and you just, it's just growing and growing, says so that's going to, you cannot have one happen and the other happen at the same time. All right, but no condemnation. And then the very last thing that I wanted was Revelation 22 verses one through four, where uh, Jesus declared that in heaven, we see the tree of life. And you could look that up. The same tree of life that was in the garden is actually multiplied because he used the word plural for trees, trees of life. So it talks about the river of God and the trees are in the middle of the river and it, it says multiply. It's or it, plural, I mean. So, what man, what was forsaken in the garden through sin, is reclaimed in the heavenly realm. The life of Jesus, the healing of the the leaves of the trees, plural, are for the healing of the nation. I've always pictured it as one one tree, but then I found out it was actually plural. Okay. And the Bible says that those who love God those who spent their life pursuing him and loving righteous, they're going, to, they're going to eat of the tree of life freely. But the flip side also says that those who loved and practiced a lie, I, I think it's interesting to use the word loved because it's one thing to stumble, it's another thing to love sin. And I, I have a, a phrase that I think, I don't remember who said it, but anyway, we're not, listen now, this is, this is crucial. We are not lovers of sin fighting against God. We are lovers of God fighting against sin. The Bible says in Hebrews, says, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I know we're all, don't strive, don't strive. I get that. There are many ways we're not supposed to strive. And yet, so use the word, striving against sin. I would to God, we would balance these things out before we just throw out our little refrigerator magnet sayings. Okay, let's find out what the whole word says. But, it's, we're not lovers of sin. We don't love sin. We hate sin. We know what it does to people. Sin ruins everything. It does. It hurts the people God loves, and that's why it says he loves righteousness and hates iniquity or sin. God hates sin because of what it does to you and me. He doesn't hate it because he hates you or he doesn't like your life. Choices. No, it's because of what it does to you and I. So we're not lovers of sin. This is one of those refrigerator magnets you should have. We're not lovers of sin fighting against God. We're lovers of God fighting against sin. Okay? We're not trying to resist the Lord. We're trying to resist sin. Okay? So there's a difference in it in Revelation 22, 1 through 4, where he says, the people that are here are those who love, L-O-V-E, love and make, that means they actually do the thing they love, a lie. Do you love truth or do you love lies? Do you love the logic and the reasoning of God? Come, let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be like scarlet, 
They shall be white as snow. God doesn't turn anyone away who genuinely repents and comes to him. And he said, I will not leave you or forsake you. You learn to love sin, you'll wind up hating God. But if you learn to love God, you'll wind up hating sin. Amen. All right, guys, God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope to see you um, Friday night, 7 o'clock. And um, yeah, and then I think I'm preaching somewhere Sunday too. So <clears throat> I'll announce that later on. So God bless you. Love you guys. Have a great day. Give yourself permission to have a great day and hope you